and welcome. Uh, my name is Pericles Lewis. I'm Yale's Vice President for Global Strategy, and it's a pleasure, a delight to welcome you to the finale of our year-long series of webinars, Yale and Brazil, supporting future science research. I'd like to begin by expressing my sympathy and concern for the current situation with the COVID pandemic in Brazil, and of course, we've experienced it here in Connecticut as well. And uh, I appreciate the great efforts that many on the call are making to combat this terrible pandemic. Uh, Yale has a longstanding and, and rich relationship with Brazil. And in fact, some of our first international students here at Yale came from Brazil, such as Joao Francisco Lima, who studied, entered at the Yale School of Medicine in 1833. And since then, Yale has proved an, uh, an exceptional training ground for uh, Brazilian leaders and scholars with a variety of programs and partnerships involving the School of Public Health at Yale, the School of Medicine, the Yale Law School, the School of Management, and the Macmillan Center's Council on Latin American and Iberian Studies. This deep history has resulted in a vibrant and growing alumni community uh, at Yale of Brazilians, either in Brazil or in the United States or in other parts of the world. President Salovey, my boss, visited Brazil a few years ago and met with our alumni and international partners. And I know that he found it inspiring to see that the partnerships and collaborations among faculty, students, and scientists uh, continue and are in a active right now. I'm especially pleased that we're able to conclude our series by featuring the leadership and the work of experts in biomedical and public health research, both here in the United States and in Brazil, who are contributing to cutting edge research efforts both to combat the current virus and disease and also to think about the world uh, when the pandemic uh, at least diminishes. Our speakers are from Yale, the Oswaldo Cruz, Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, Fio Cruz in Brazil and the University of Sao Paulo. And I'll note that highlights of our, uh, we have highlights of some of our partnerships with these institutions. So among our many activities with the University of Sao Paulo, uh, Yale's a strategic partner as part of the print program to jointly fund University of Sao Paulo and Yale faculty, researchers, and graduate students. We're in the process of renewing our MOU with the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation to further our research collaborations with that important organization. And I'm very grateful for our continued strong relationships with both of these institutions. So I deeply appreciate our faculty and student efforts that make these partnerships thrive. And I, I'm glad that many people from both institutions are here on the line. But let me just, uh, kick off the panel by introducing Professor Albert Koh, who will moderate today's session. And Albert will then introduce the panelists. Professor Koh is the department chair and professor of epidemiology and microbial diseases at the Yale School of Public Health and a professor of medicine in the Yale School of Medicine. His research centers on health problems that have emerged at the interface of rapid urbanization and social inequity. Unfortunately, there's no shortage of subjects for him to research. In addition to his faculty role at Yale, he's collaborating researcher at the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation of the Brazilian Ministry of Health and spent 15 years living and doing research in Salvador, Brazil, before joining the Yale faculty in 2010. Uh, Albert coordinates research and training programs on urban health in Brazil, and these multidisciplinary programs include epidemiology, ecology, social, social science and translational research, uh, relating to prevention and control strategies for infectious, disease, infectious diseases in urban settings, including rat-borne leptospirosis, sorry, hard one to say, dengue, of course, uh, not too long ago, Zika, and of course, now COVID-19. And Albert is also the program director for the National Institutes of Health Global Health Equity Scholars Program, which trains fellows at 21 international sites. Albert is now especially well known here in Connecticut because he's uh, led uh, public health guidance for the government and for the university and nationally and internationally on uh, how to respond to COVID-19. And in particular, he served as co-chair of the Reopen Connecticut Advisory Group and an advisor to Governor Ned Lamont. And when I watch the news on our public television station in the evenings, there's often Albert there recommending that we all get our vaccine. So he's contributing to the to the public health campaign in that way too. Albert, we're very honored to have you as one of our leading faculty here at Yale uh, and uh, to continue the great traditions in the study of epidemiology and public health at uh, the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine. So thank you very much for moderating this session today. Well, thank you very much, Pericles, for, for uh, those kind words, but also for convening this important uh, uh, forum 
And we have a lot to cover today and, and really quite an exceptional group of panelists. So I'm just going to give a, a preamble that sets up the, the purpose and the goals of this, uh, this forum. So over the past year, we've all suffered from uh, a devastating pandemic, whether in Brazil, the United States and globally, we have cause for hope you know, after these tragic losses that we've suffered. Uh, but there's significant work ahead when we think about the stark inequities that COVID has revealed and the challenge of vaccinating all segments of the world's population. However, we're at a strategic point in the pandemic, much akin to the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944, which created the plan to rebuild the international economic system and laid the foundations for the IMF and the World Bank while the World War II was uh, still being fought. So today's forum will initiate that discussion on the path forward as a collaboration between Yale and its longstanding partners in Brazil, specifically the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation from uh, the Brazilian Ministry of Health, which I've had the privilege of, of being associated with and working together with for the last 25 years, as well as um, University of Sao Paulo. And both of these are leading international institutions in, in the fields of public health and biomedical research. Uh, we specifically will use this forum to reflect on lessons learned during the pandemic and identify how we need to shape research, education, and policy as we move forward uh, in, the, um, in Brazil, the United States, and globally, and as part of the response to COVID, but also moving beyond COVID. And we're especially fortunate to have convened the leaders of the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, which we refer, refer to enduringly as Fio Cruz, the University of Sao Paulo and Yale, who in their own right are the international thought leaders in global health and also public health heroes, given their contributions in creating universal access to vaccines, essential drugs, and their key roles in the global response against health threats such as AIDS. Uh, o cara da comida, não sei. In now COVID. And Paulo, I think you may have to, Paulo, I think you have to put on mute, yeah. Okay, good. And so, so with that as a, as a preamble, let's let's get started. And I think this next session, each of the speakers will speak, be presenting for seven minutes their thoughts and ideas around some framing questions. What's the most important lessons learned during the pandemic? Um, you know how you know what we will have achieved after the pandemic is over, which will directly translate into sustained benefits. And then what are the priority areas for research, research development, education, um, which require critical investment in that were neglected perhaps in the past. So with that, let me introduce um, you know, a really great privilege to have uh, Dr. Nizia Trinidadji Lima, who uh, consider also a close friend as well as um, compañero. And uh, Nizia is a president of the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. She's the first woman to occupy that position in its 120 year history. She served as a coordinator of Fiocruz's social sciences and also its Zika virus uh, response networks. Since the beginning of the current pandemic, she's been called upon not only nationally, not only at Fiocruz, but internationally uh, to contribute to the, uh, the response to the pandemic. As a member of the Lancet COVID-19 committee, uh, she co-chairs the an important role on the Economic Recovery Steering Group, which is charged by the United Nations to create the roadmap for recovery after COVID-19. She's a member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences and has received numerous awards, including the Nisi de Silveira Award given by the Special Office of Women Policies at, uh, from the city of uh, Rio de Janeiro. So it's a great pleasure to hear uh, Nisia and her thoughts of where we stand and where we need to move, uh, move forward. Thank you very much, dear and honored Cole. I will speak in Portuguese because I think that is better. My English, uh, my Portuguese than my English. <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the invitation and uh, it's a pleasure to share this session with Paul Cruz, Luis Carlos, uh, from the University of São Paulo. Uh, bem, falando em português, uh, quero não só agradecer, mas falar, uh, agradecer também a uh, Dr. Luis, que fez a introdução, vice-presidente da Estratégia Global, uh, e uh, ter essa oportunidade como 
a oportunidade de pensar né, o que precisa ser feito na pesquisa biomédica, na pesquisa em saúde. Pode passar, por favor? Eu não sei se eu posso eu mesmo passar, creio que não. Pode passar? Uh, next, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, um, sorry, yes. Well, this recommendation, I, uh, I, 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 ela, muitas outras foram mais circunscritas é, e é, pode-se comparar com é, inundações, epidemias de fome, terremotos, erupções vulcânicas é, que fizeram sua história em termos de destruição humana. Ou seja, a pandemia como já de Covid-19, como já mencionou, é, Richard Horton, editor é, da revista The Lancet, pode ser vista como um desastre, uma catástrofe, pelo seu efeito devastador em várias dimensões sociais. Né? É uma citação da Science. Next, please. The next, please. Ah. Ah, o interessante é que essa citação que eu acabei de mencionar, ela foi publicada em 1919, em maio de 19, pela revista Science. É, e não fazia, obviamente, refer referência à pandemia de Covid-19, mas à, à pandemia de gripe espanhola. Por que esse paralelo? Eu, eu acho que essa é uma primeira lição que eu gostaria de destacar da nossa pandemia. Durante a gripe espanhola, se acentuou muito e esse artigo da Science acentua este ponto, a ausência de meios científicos o que a, e tecnológicos para o combate à pandemia. O que a pandemia é, de Covid-19 nos mostra foi uma alta resposta da ciência e tecnologia, é, faria destaque os testes diagnósticos e vacinas desenvolvidas em tempo recorde. Exatamente por nós termos essa visão, né, do arsenal científico e tecnológico tão robusto, isso torna mais evidente um ponto fundamental para a agenda de pesquisa daqui para frente. Ela revela a profunda desigualdade entre os países e no interior dos próprios países no acesso a esses benefícios de ciência e tecnologia e que a vacina eh, seria um exemplo bastante contundente como estamos acompanhando hoje no mundo. Tenho acompanhado essa questão eh, com o presidente da Fiocruz, que atuamos né, nas várias frentes da pesquisa ao desenvolvimento de recursos tecnológicos, como os testes, e o desenvolvimento e a produção aqui na Fiocruz da vacina eh, Covid-19, a partir do acordo com o Oxford e a farmacêutica AstraZeneca. Então, o que eu quero salientar? A desigualdade é um ponto central, a meu ver, o papel da desigualdade, dos determinantes sociais e ambientais da saúde, como certamente o Paulo vai focalizar, eles mostram toda a sua força nesse momento. Seja na gênese da própria pandemia, como também nos seus efeitos, uma vez que a pandemia vem gerando novas desigualdades. Então, esse é o primeiro ponto que eu gostaria de é, de demarcar. E nessa desigualdade há também uma desigualdade de tempo. Né? Os tempos de resposta são muito diferentes, então temos que ter muito cuidado quando falamos da recuperação pós-pandemia, porque o Brasil, como sabem, ainda está imerso na crise é, do que vem sendo denominado uma segunda onda em nosso país, Muitos autores apontando a possibilidade ainda de uma nova onda, dado o patamar muito elevado do número de casos e, infelizmente, também é, de mortes. Portanto, essa defasagem de tempo é um aspecto, a meu ver, importantíssimo de ser considerado para que esse elemento de desigualdade entre os países não se reforce. 
Cross, uh, next, please. É, para uma agenda de pesquisa, né, é, eu considero fundamental é, pensarmos nos impactos da pandemia diante dos objetivos da Agenda 2030. Então, esse slide que é, é dessa publicação, né, desse relatório do Banco Mundial, eles nos mostra uma projeção é, efetuada quanto à redução da pobreza extrema é, até 2030 e nós vemos no segundo gráfico a estimativa de que o crescimento da, da pobreza extrema chegando a crescer para 70 a 100 milhões de pessoas em 2020. Então, é, eu creio que esse é um outro dado absolutamente importante de ser considerado, que é o impacto da pandemia na geração é, de novas desigualdades e é, na extrema pobreza. O next, please. Next. Bom, é, alguns, algumas recomendações feitas pela Organização Mundial de Saúde para os sistemas de saúde é, precisam ser consideradas nesse contexto de pensarmos uma agenda de pesquisa para a saúde pública. É, é, principalmente, eu diria, sintetizando os 16 pontos que estão nesse quadro, é a necessidade do acesso aos elementos de tecnologia de saúde, aos insumos de saúde, a expansão e organização dos serviços de saúde, não é, que foram bastante impactados diante da pandemia da Covid-19, e a mobilização de suporte financeiro para todos esses elementos. Eu acrescentaria a necessidade também, que está aí no quadro, da da organização da proteção social. Então, os sistemas de ciência e tecnologia, os sistemas de proteção social, a sua vinculação serão fundamentais para esse processo. Por fim, eu gostaria de... Pode passar? Next, please. Eu gostaria de mencionar os cinco pilares que essa agenda é, de pesquisa, pensando a recuperação pós-Covid-19, levanta, mas que são elementos a serem trabalhados desde já com os cinco pilares essenciais. Next, please. The next. É... Antes de falar desses desafios, né, os cinco pilares é, são os sistemas de saúde, como o primeiro pilar, a proteção social, a resposta econômica, as, o quarto pilar as políticas macroeconômicas, nessas políticas macroeconômicas, políticas de desenvolvimento científico, tecnológico, de produção local, a área qual a Fiocruz está bastante direcionada, e a coesão social. Né? Quer dizer, nós podemos tirar várias lições dessa pandemia, mas no processo de reconstrução, esses pilares serão fundamentais. Por fim, é acentuar que em todos os campos de pesquisa se fará necessário uma abordagem interdisciplinar não entendida como um quebra-cabeças, como um mosaico de conhecimentos, mas, de fato, como um processo de negociação entre disciplinas, de proposição de questões que possam fazer com que o rumo, que desde já deve ser tomado, que deve estar na agenda de pesquisa, tenha esses desafios da contemporaneidade como eixos centrais, desafios estes, é, que serão fundamentais para que a resposta a esta crise é, vá ao encontro de um mundo com mais desenvolvimento sustentável, em nível internacional, com solidariedade, fortalecimento de blocos regionais e de acentuar 
como questão central a superação da crise da democracia que acompanha a pandemia. Pontos, aliás, especialmente esse último, que foi bem enfatizado na fala do presidente Biden é, na última segunda-feira. Então, eu creio que esses desafios ambientais, demográficos, de superar as desigualdades, de aprofundar a, a superação também de caminhos para que as desigualdades no campo da ciência e tecnologia sejam superadas, é, são questões centrais quando pensamos uma agenda de pesquisa é, com vistas à experiência da Covid-19. Muito obrigada, essa é a reflexão inicial que eu gostaria de compartilhar. Thank you very much. Okay. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much, uh, Nizia, for the um, really the the global perspective on the challenges that are ahead for us, and uh, especially, especially, oh, especially from uh, especially from the uh, point of view of the um, uh, from your privileged position at you know involved in the efforts of the United Nations and, and WHO. So let me pass on to the next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Paulo Bus, who is a full professor at the National School of Public Health and director of the Center for Global Health at, at Fio Cruz, or the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. And Paulo is uh, uh, you know, one of the leading um, uh, figures nationally and internationally in the field of uh, global health. He was former president of Fio Cruz twice elected director of the National School of Public Health. Paulo was the Brazilian representative on the WHO's executive board between 2008, 2011. And he also served as the president of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. Uh, Paulo is an accomplished researcher with more than 100 papers, many book chapters that really laid out key issues that we've been facing, whether it's social determinants of health or, or global health, in 2002, he was awarded the Medical Merit Honor, the highest health award uh, given to a, a health professional in Brazil. And in 2007, he received the Rio Branco Merit Honor, both conferred by the President of the Republic. So please, Paulo, it's, it's really a great privilege to have you participating in this. And it, it would be nice, to, we're looking forward to your perspectives. Uh, muito obrigado. Eu queria cumprimentar ao Albert. É, queria também cumprimentar a, a Pericles, a minha presidente, Lízia, e também Saad e Luiz Carlos, que compartilham o nosso esse seminário. Eu vou complementar a apresentação da minha presidente falando na pesquisa em saúde pública. Pode passar o próximo slide. Next, please. Um, in this next, please, o enfoque que eu vou dar para a pesquisa de saúde pública é o que se chama Essential Public Health Functions ou Essential Public Health Services. É, e existe, os pesquisadores e os acadêmicos e os gestores têm, têm trabalhado muito uh, em definir globalmente desde os anos 80 o que são as funções essenciais da saúde pública. E elas, na realidade, são um conjunto de ações fundamentais que têm que ser tomadas para alcançar os objetivos de saúde pública, de implementar, promover, proteger e restaurar a saúde da população por meio da ação coletiva. Essa discussão faz com que se definiram, iniciando-se esses trabalhos pelo Instituto de Medicina dos Estados Unidos, na na década de 80, eu tive a honra de participar da primeira dessas reuniões. Depois, durante os anos 90, projetos da Organização Pan-Americana da Saúde, do CDC, definiram as três grandes funções da saúde pública, que depois se desdobram em outras 11 funções, que são de avaliação, desenvolvimento de política e asseguramento, garantia, que são os três grandes funções da saúde pública. E, desde então, vem sendo atualizado esse conceito das funções essenciais. Next, please. Next slide, please. É, o CDC, 
uh, definiu uh, as funções essenciais, o, 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 o USCDC, que são os, os, os serviços essenciais de saúde pública, redefinidos agora em setembro de 2020. A Organização Mundial da Saúde fez esse trabalho por um Delphi Survey uh, com uma primeira lista eh, global em 97. A Organização Pan-Americana uh, trabalha desde bastante tempo definindo 11 funções e em outubro de 2020 a Organização Pan-Americana definiu, uh, renovou para 2021, digamos, ou melhor dito, para o século 21, uma nova lista né? E, e muitos países nos últimos anos têm adaptado o que são essas funções essenciais da saúde pública. E, finalmente, a Federação Mundial de Associações de Saúde Pública, também nesse mês de abril, trabalhou no que se chamou um avanço uh, das funções essenciais de saúde pública para prevenir e enfrentar a próxima, as próximas pandemias. Pode passar next week. Next, please. Essas são as funções essenciais, eu vou particularizar. É o avaliação e monitoramento da situação de saúde da população, os fatores que influenciam a saúde e the community needs and assets. Investigar, diagnosticar e abordar os problemas de saúde e os perigos que afetam a população. Fazer comunicação efetiva para informar e educar a população sobre saúde, fatores que influenciam a saúde e como implementar, como melhorar uh, esses fatores, um, mobilizar comunidades e parcerias para implementar a saúde, definir e implementar políticas, planos e leis que façam, que tragam impacto sobre a saúde, a utilização de ações legais e regulatórias assegurar o acesso equitativo, a equidade no acesso aos serviços individuais e aos serviços coletivos da saúde pública, desenvolver uma adequada força de trabalho em saúde, implementar e inovar essas funções essenciais por intermédio da avaliação, da pesquisa e do, da, da, da implementação contínua da qualidade estabelecer e desenvolver, além de manter uma forte infraestrutura organizacional para a saúde pública e, finalmente, abordar os determinantes sociais da saúde por meio da ação governamental, intersetorial e de ações da sociedade civil. O próximo, por favor. É, no pro... Next, please. Um, o desenvolvimento que teve... Esses conhecimentos a que me referi, portanto, o desenvolvimento nas Américas, a partir dos resultados da pesquisa em saúde pública, foi fundamentalmente a de que as inequidades no acesso e a ênfase nos cuidados curativos, deixando de lado os cuidados preventivos e a promoção da saúde e a abordagem dos determinantes sociais, este é o quadro que nós temos que redefinir. E essa redefinição que vem sendo feita sob a liderança da Organização Pan-Americana, que é o órgão hemisférico, autoridade sanitária hemisférica, é através do acesso universal à saúde e da cobertura universal e através da estratégia chamada uh, saúde em todas as políticas, Health in All Policies. O próximo slide, que é o último, e Celeste, next, please, é as os desafios que nós temos para a pesquisa pós-Covid em saúde pública, a meu juízo, a meu ver, estão aí. Identificar, por meio de estudos e pesquisas, as fragilidades e as fortalezas dos sistemas de saúde em relação às funções essenciais que são, na verdade, vão nos dar com isso a visão do que nós precisamos produzir de conhecimento e inovação para melhorar os sistemas de saúde. A Covid-19 foi muito, bateu seriamente no sistema de saúde americano, também no sistema de saúde brasileiro, também no sistema de saúde de toda a América Latina 
E, portanto, este é um grande desafio, compreender pelo, pela pesquisa, pela avaliação, o que ocorreu com os nossos sistemas de saúde. E, e considerando as funções essenciais, o que, que nós temos que conhecer e melhorar nas funções essenciais de saúde pública, que, se adequadamente construídas e implementadas, trarão resultados positivos e nos, ajudam, nos ajudarão a enfrentar as próximas pandemias que seguramente, não sabemos quando, mas seguramente virão. Essa definição, esse estudo, tem que ser feito em conjunto, pela academia com os managers, pela academia com os gestores, definindo assim as necessidades em pesquisa, o que nós temos que conhecer e desenvolvendo a partir disso programas e projetos que, a meu ver também, tem que ser implementado em conjunto a academia e os gestores. E, para terminar, os desafios da pesquisa em saúde pública para pós-pandemia implica também no desenvolvimento de aperfeiçoamento de sistemas de vigilância. Esse é um pequeno componente, mas muito importante, incluindo a vigilância genômica, dada a variabilidade do, das variantes que aparecem é, do SARS-CoV-2, que é o coronavírus, o vírus causador da Covid-19. Quero destacar esse último ponto também. Nós temos que criar inovações, tanto da genômica, para o estudo da genômica viral, quanto para a implementação de sistemas de serviço de vigilância, sistemas de vigilância à saúde capazes de melhorar o controle da pandemia. Então, a partir das, das funções essenciais, identificar quais são os gaps de conhecimento e de inovação e construir programas e projetos acadêmicos reunindo o gestor e a universidade, o gestor e os institutos de pesquisa. Essa é a minha mensagem. Muito obrigado pela oportunidade. Thank you very Thank you so much. much. Thank you very much, Paulo. That was uh, very important points that you made about having to go back to the essential, you know, functions of essential public health functions and and really drill down deep what went wrong and what went well during the pandemic. Um, so with that, let's go to uh, the next speaker, and it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Luis Ferreira, who is a full professor and also the Dean of the Institute of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Sao Paulo. Since 2000, he has served as the head of the Laboratory for Vaccine Development Microbiology, also the coordinator of the Vaccine Research Core Group at the University of Sao Paulo and director of the University of Sao Paulo Institute Pasteur Research Platform. Dr. Ferreira is a member of the Bioeconomy Commission of the Federal in Federation of Industries of the state of Sao Paulo, which is the largest state in, in, uh, with respect to population and, and economy in, in Brazil. Together with his research team, he's established a company for developing anti-tumor vaccines and their clinical variation, evaluation. And Dr. Ferreira has worked and closely collaborates with many leading international vaccine research institutes, including the Center for Vaccine Development at the University of Maryland, Tufts University, Institute Ma Mas Planck, as well as Institut Pasteur in, in France, and part of the, the, uh, the Pasteur network. So with that, Luis Carlos, uh, Luis Carlos is having internet connections, so he's going to be speaking without his video on. But uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Luis Carlos. Thank you, Albert. It is really a pleasure. Uh, to be part of this uh, special uh, session in which we are discussing such huge challenges that are facing the whole world, but particularly in our country in South America and Brazil. And um, it's also a great, great pleasure to, and I, I would like to uh, say uh, congratulations to all the panelists here and people joining this section. As, as you said, uh, uh, Albert, I'm presently working at the University of Sao Paulo. This is the largest and, uh, well, I would say the most pre prestigious uh, university in, in, in Latin America. It's very productive in the generation of knowledge. Uh, and, and especially during this pandemic, 
University of Sao Paulo has been very active on the generation of uh, scientific information regarding the virus, the SARS-CoV virus, and the, the disease, the COVID-19. That is, has been translated into hundreds of contributions in papers and in, uh, in articles that had been uh, published and submitted to different journals all over the world. But understanding the problem of our, of our country and uh, what we can do here at the University of Sao Paulo, I have a few personal points that are, uh, well, would be uh, some ways we could uh, improve the preparation of our country and, and our state of Sao Paulo here to face problems like we are uh, seeing today. One point that is very clear to me is that uh, uh, you know, uh, science is the basics of every uh, challenge that we want to overcome. And uh, in Brazil, the, uh, the, the universities, as well as the United States, are center for generation of knowledge and, and scientific knowledge. But uh, it's clear that if you want to translate uh, achievements in science and to get benefit to the society, it's essential that universities like ours should be working very close to other uh, uh, players of, in, the, in the society. And the two main players in the case of uh, health problems like COVID, uh, of course, are the companies. And, and this uh, pandemic has illustrated how important uh, the partnership between scientific institutions and company, uh, and company working with the vaccines in the case of the develop the very fast to, uh, development of several vaccines capable to help us to control the pandemics. This has been a, a clear to the whole world, and especially for, for us here at the University of Brazil, that we should improve our uh, uh, priority to find ways in which universities and companies could work together in order to improve the way we can transfer the, our, the knowledge generate here to companies. And this means to really work together. And uh, I, I wonder if we really could uh, have more people being prepared to develop research in our university in a way that uh, the companies could uh, somehow improve the quality of the work in order that it could be translated easily to, to, to market. So I've been involved in several, a few initiatives concerning working between scientists of university and scientists of companies, especially startup companies, and, uh, and uh, some uh, well, achievements, including the, 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 the development of new diagnostic uh, kits for Zika virus has been developed here and in partnership with uh, co small companies, Brazilian companies, and our institute at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, the, 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 and this is one way I believe that we can uh, get some lessons and improve what has been done so far here in our university. The other point that I really believe that uh, this uh, big pandemic is teaching to us that uh, uh, we should be and we should work together, not only universities and companies, but also uh, universities and research centers from different places in the world. I've been involved in a recent uh, experience of uh, helping to establish an agreement between Institut Pasteur, France, Fiocruz, because this is a tripartite agreement, and the University of Sao Paulo, uh, in order to tackle a challenge in, in, in global health, especially infectious disease capable to inflict all uh, pandemic risks. And this was uh, uh, you know, stimulated by the Zika outbreak a few years ago, five, six years, years ago. 
And at the end of uh, that period, we had uh, the possibility to build in, inside our campus uh, a research lab in which scientists from Institut Pasteur, scientists from the University of Sao Paulo, and also people from Oswaldo Cruz, from the Fundação Oswaldo Cruz, Fiocruz, uh, could work together and in facing challenge as the COVID-19. Uh, this platform has been uh, open uh, last year in March uh, during the pandemic and has been dedicated uh, full energy and, and, uh, and resource to help the, 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 the state and the, and the, the institution to face the, 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 the pandemic in doing diagnostic tests and also helping to test material for, for, for uh, like protection material uh, that uh, like masks that are able to control and, uh, and avoid infection by the, the virus. And uh, we are also carrying out several research in order to understand better the mechanism by which the virus uh, cause uh, different aspects of the disease. But that isn't a good example. It's still in the beginning. Uh, that's uh, the number of people uh, are presently working and that's, that facilities are small, but the infrastructure is rather good, including a, a, a few laboratories, four units of uh, uh, biosafety level three, which are uh, essential to work with uh, virus like SARS-CoV and people uh, are being trained or have been trained to work on such conditions. And Institute Pasteur was very important to uh, help us to uh, adapt new standards or at least European standards for the safe biosafety level work that we are doing there. And then and, and I believe that this experience with the Institute Pasteur shall be uh, increased at the University of Sao Paulo, not only with the uh, institutes like, uh, like the Pasteur, but also with universities with uh, long experience and, 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 re and, and recognition in, in health science. And I believe that uh, at Yale, it's one of the big partners that university, international partners that University of Sao Paulo has in the world. Uh, uh, here, at, attending our meeting, we can uh, we have our uh, coordinator of the international agency of uh, cooperation, Dr. Valmo Tricoli, and he knows very well that Yale is one of our very important partners both in academic and different uh, areas, and also in science. And I really hope that at the end of this period, that or, or me, even now, we could strengthen our connections and, and do uh, science together, as we are already doing uh, in a very different way, but uh, we are working and publishing together with you. But uh, I think this experience should be enlarged in uh, institutional uh, uh, ground. And that's it. That's my two points that I would like to add to, to this discussion. And I'm ready to uh, later to answer any questions regarding our contributions here. So first of all, thank you very much, Luis Carlos. And, uh, and I think those are very important points. And we can see through the last three presentations, the diversity of challenges, but also the diversity of solutions that need to be made in, in particular the last in the sense of the biomedical research and, and translating that for societal benefits. So with that, I'm going to then hand over this, the, the last presentation to a close colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Saad Omer, who is the inaugural director of the Yale Institute of Global Health and professor of medicine and epidemiology at the Yale schools of uh, medicine and, and public health. Dr. Omer is a leading researcher in the field of vaccinology. Um, his research is, is broad in the sense that he works has worked in many of the important um, high burden settings in Africa, Asia, and uh, the Americas, 
uh, and he, his research is focused on the epidemiology of respiratory viruses such as influenza, uh, respiratory syncytial virus, and, and now COVID. Uh, Saad is one of the leading experts in vaccinology in the country. He, served on, he serves on several advisory panels, including the US National Vaccine Advisory Committee, the Presidential Advisory Council on Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria, the Vaccine Innovation Working Group, and the WHO Expert Advisory Group for Healthcare uh, Worker Vaccination. Uh, Saad has had multiple, you know, um, has received multiple awards, including the Morris Hillerman Award uh, given by the National Foundation of Infectious Disease. He's our resident expert on vaccines, but much broader as the director of our Institute of Global Health. Saad, please. Thanks, and it's my pleasure uh, to speak to this uh, group. And, and, and thank you, Albert, for your years of uh, collaboration with Brazil. And, and thank you for the Brazilian colleagues who have enriched uh, the global health portfolio and collaborations uh, at Yale, both in terms of research, education, and service. Um, and so, so it is a privilege to, um, to, to be um, ad addressing this group. Uh, I'll, I'll frame my questions, my, my, my talk uh, or my comments around a, a few um, cool questions, uh, you know, which is the, the first one is, what is the most important lesson learned during the pandemic, uh, which should guide us how we respond to these things in the future? And to my mind, we had a lot of scientific tools that were available. Um, at least in the early part of the pandemic, the countries that successfully uh, combated this pandemic did not do it through new tools. Later on, uh, newer tools uh, were developed, uh, like mRNA vaccines and viral vector vaccines, et cetera. They are new in the sense that they hadn't been scaled up, but the technology had been invested in uh, for uh, a while. But so it wasn't our failures in countries, and, and let's be honest that there were certain failures as a global community, um, and especially in certain regions, countries, et cetera, and subnational level, where countries succeeded and where they did not succeed, the single biggest difference was not science. Everyone had the same tools at their disposal. It was governance. And often as scientists and researchers we think that it's outside that sort of box within we uh, operate, but we will have to be going forward advocates for good governance. Uh, and it, it doesn't have to be, and it should not be a partisan exercise. Um, and it's just better if it is not a partisan exercise, but we should demand good, competent, science-based, evidence-informed uh, governance in public health emergencies, because that made the difference. Uh, and that made the difference in terms of life and death. Um, and so that's going forward, that's the single biggest lesson I have in terms of what we could have done better. The other thing that actually is a positive side of things that, that, that did pan out, uh, but that was also a difference, uh, is that the research enterprises and the research entities that, that move the science forward in this pandemic, the big difference was collaboration versus non-collaboration. Um, and groups, uh, whether within the institutions or across institutions, that had the consequentialist outlook of getting stuff done and putting the, the research focus and the, and, and the importance of the research question first, and then working backwards and building teams, et cetera, without consideration too much of individual credit, were more successful and then ended up getting more credit. And that's the irony of it, uh, than others who tried to go um, uh, and, and do... Uh, who try to fly alone and, and, and try to do science on their own. So that's you know something to keep in mind that that team science is what is uh, that that um, acquires a new importance, a new significance in public health emergencies like pandemics. In terms of you know another thing that I want to talk about is uh, you know what will what are some of the things that were done during the pandemic that will outlast? There are several things. But in the interest of time, I'll focus on vaccine development and deployment. Uh, the first thing is that um, they are, we now have two newer platforms, obviously for both of these platforms, uh, well, there are several platforms that have been used to, <coughs> to develop vaccines uh, around this pandemic, but the two salient platforms 
that are newer uh, and had never been used at this scale are the mRNA vaccines and um, viral vector vaccines. I think that's a big boost uh, to our portfolio of, uh, of, um, of, of vaccines and vaccine classes that will serve us well, not just in pandemics, but for uh, all sorts of other research and, and for all sorts of other diseases that have been intractable in terms of vaccine development. And, and I'm, I can't guarantee that we will have a vaccine uh, using a platform for HIV, TB, um, um, malaria, et cetera, although malaria has shown promise through existing vaccines, but there are ma major challenges that are, th that are out there. And RSV is, is another one. There are major challenges out there that require newer technology and could benefit from that. So that's one thing. The other thing is the clinical trial within saying within the vaccines, the clinical trial design and the expediency through which you can do high quality large trials um, and get solid results um, is extremely important. And that has shown not just by sort of positive action, by contrast as well. So vaccine companies and entities and institutes that went with trials earlier on had more certainty and were able to uh, streamline the process compared to some of the other issues when, when phase three wasn't uh, seen as feasible, and it is not feasible in, in a lot of situations, uh, but, but there, is di there are dividends. There is the ability to, to say that you can expedite trials and do high quality trials, and those lessons are likely to outlast uh, this pandemic. Another thing that we should keep in mind is, um, is the fact that we have a, um, a whole host of innovations in vaccine safety science and immunology that have informed. So looking at uh, the, the responses to variants quickly, doing uh, sort of multi-antigen uh, sort of testing, uh, using sort of high throughput techniques to look at autoantigens, responses to autoantigens, for example, that are coming to fore are important innovations that will serve us very well uh, going forward. So now switching to uh, what we should do in the future. What are, you know, what is the outlook uh, in terms of the, the priority areas where we should focus? I think there were a couple of big scientific gaps that we will have to fill. <coughs> <coughs> and they will include research on non-pharmaceutical interventions. We didn't have good quality data uh, around masks. Uh, let's be honest about it. Uh, we didn't have high quality evidence base. So it is known that we didn't have high quality data that added to uh, uncertainty in the early parts of the outbreak in terms of policymaking and recommendations. But, but generally speaking, um, these kinds of, um, we need to ask the question why these kinds of trials were not done. So these can be done and, and Brazil has a strong history of trying out, you know, conducting huge uh, and, and, and pretty substantive field trials. And I think leveraging that infrastructure would be extremely important um, by uh, sort of countries such as Brazil, but more broadly as well. The last thing I would say that we will have to bring the same level of vigor and rigor in vaccine communication science and public health communication science. And that has been an area that has been neglected uh, and has been thought of as an afterthought, and it gets us every time we don't pay attention to it. So I hope going forward, that would be a proactive area of attention, not just through disinformation, but also this more subtler forms of uh, hesitance to accept public health recommendations. What is the most appropriate way to communicate that? So bring the evidence base, the, bring the latest communication science, bring the latest behavioral signs in the service of answering these questions. And, and I think we'll be served well by focusing these uh, focusing on these questions going forward. Thank you very much, Saad. That, so that was a really nice overview, a summary of kind of key pressure points, you know, that we've experienced, but also what we will experience when we go uh, go ahead. So as um, as Asia has put into the chat, and let me just first of all thank you very much, uh, Asia Nupain and. Uh, and Megan for, for all their help in setting up this, um, uh, the forum. 
we will go extend this because of the questions. We will extend this if all the panelists can stay on for another 10 minutes until um, uh, 110, you know, uh, Brazilian time and, uh, and 1210 uh, our time, or I'm sorry, 2 p 210 Brazilian time, 110 our, our time. And uh, please, if anybody wants to, we have some questions in the box, uh, but if there are other questions, please, um, uh, please feel free to ask and put them in into the questions and answer uh, box. So let me let me go through. I I I just want to do a quick recap. So this was this was really important and very diverse. Um, what do you call it? Uh, perspectives that we've heard from the four panelists that really capture very different act. Uh, different aspects, but very synergistic aspects. And many of these have come down to kind of structural issues, uh, whether it's specific evidence gaps. And as many of you, and particularly Sa Saad has said in the past, in, in non-traditional areas of research, you know, whether it's non-pharmaceuticals, whether it's vaccine acceptance and, and so forth. The second is structural gaps or challenges with our essential functions, healthcare functions. Uh, and this is what Paulo's point has been. Um, I think the other um, part, which I think Nizia had touched upon, as well as uh, Luis Carlos, is that we need new approaches to development and translating in translating intervention. And I think all, in everyone's mind is the issue of governance and good governance. And certainly here in the United States, we've witnessed what happens with poor governance and how that impacted policy. But I think one issue that I think comes up, and you know, you, need, you, you have to have structure, but you have to have people. And I'd like to ask Nizia a quick question on my part. You know, we've seen, we, you know, it, 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 it really struck us, many of us to the heart. Uh, Brazil had probably one of the best public health workforces in the world in terms of their training, in terms of the expertise, in terms of their ability to react to yellow fever or Zika. And we've seen that degraded. And we've seen, you know, we've seen, you know, somewhat of a decimation of that workforce. Uh, Nizia, what, what what do we need to do to um, turn that around, and and how should that get turned around? Uh, thank you very much for your question, Alban School, and uh, uh, for all of having this very interesting discussion. I was speaking in Portuguese. Uh, well, um, nós acabamos de publicar na Fundação João Cruz, um extenso trabalho sobre a força de trabalho em saúde e o impacto da Covid no Brasil. É um trabalho que está acessível, organizado pela professora Maria Helena Machado, da Escola Nacional de Saúde Pública. É, além do impacto em termos das condições de saúde desses profissionais, mostrou uh, o impacto na saúde mental, tema que nós temos discutido com estudos é, sobre a força de trabalho em saúde, tanto é, nos profissionais médicos, na enfermagem e também o extenso trabalho dos agentes comunitários de saúde. É, um ponto necessário a ser feito, é, que se discute no Brasil, é, em termos da área de saúde pública, temos carreiras para a saúde pública, estabilidade desses profissionais. Houve muitos investimentos no Brasil desde a criação do Sistema Único de Saúde, com a qualificação, com a formação, a Fiocruz mesmo tem uma diversidade de programas eh, que vão desde treinamentos e até mestrados e doutorados profissionais para a força de trabalho em saúde, mas isso não tem sido acompanhado é, por uma política de maior estabilidade em termos de postos de trabalho, né, de carreiras nesta área. Então, eu apontaria, é, esse foi algo muito importante que a pandemia deixou muito em evidência. É, um, eu acho que esse é o ponto principal. Mas eu gostaria também de agregar a importância de uma visão integrada do sistema de saúde e dentro dessa visão, um programa específico no que se refere à força de trabalho. Por fim, quer dizer que o doutor Rafa Maga dizia que em Almata, né, com toda a discussão da saúde para todos, 
é, um ponto que tinha ficado a desejar é exatamente pensar os trabalhadores de saúde como ao lado da sociedade naturalmente, dos gestores, como o aspecto mais importante para promover mudanças de saúde. Ok, thank you for that, uh, Nizia, for that. And, and that's going to be a big, big lift in the future for all, all of we, we have to do this in the United States as well. So I'm going to take two questions that came in and join them, and they both are on the same theme. And maybe we can get several people's um, input. Um, so one is, what's, what are your thoughts on preparation and prevention against future pandemics? And if it's, um, and is there something that we're specifically uh, have to be concerned about and what do we need to do for the future? Um, and, and I think the second question is a very similar one, but it's more on the global scale. So I think the first one, uh, I'm gonna ask Luis Carlos to ask, um, what, what do we need to do to be, be better prepared for future pandemics and to prevent them in the future? You've laid out some ideas before and then I'll, I'll, I'll switch to Paolo and, and Saad to get their thoughts on the global issues. Oh, but in my opinion, the key point is collaboration. And collaboration means a partnership. And that means to have institutions and people talking, exchange uh, data and doing things together. You said that uh, two points that make uh, is essential for any achievement in science, but also improvement of the society is to have good infrastructure without the infrastructure, of course, in, and you don't can do you don't perform and but also and more maybe more important good people well trained people and in this kind of uh, collaborations between academy government and companies and international collaborations should be enforced uh, in my opinion this is key we are we were fa facing here in brazil Fundação Oswaldo Cruz, Fio Cruz, uh, University of São Paulo. We are starting to work uh, together since some time ago. We have uh, a few research uh, projects being, being conducted, but I believe that we had to improve even more, be more aggressive to uh, work together uh, with science being done in, at the University of São Paulo and, and and transferring this to Fio Cruz, but also I believe in the international collaboration. And I believe that Yale can uh, uh, show us uh, many things that can be adapted to Brazil and help us to reduce our inequities and in everything that you know in Brazil, we need so much. No, and, and, you know, Luis Carlos, that's an important point. And, and certainly this is one of the, you know, hope, uh, hopes that we have or aspirations we have with this forum is how we can work. We have convenios, convenios with USP and with Fiocruz and how can we make this, you know, the sum, you know, the, create the synergies through, through collaboration. You know, we thought we got it somewhat right with Zika, you know, and also when we think about GLOPID and CEPI and, many of these into, but we, we really didn't get it right. And that's what we've learned, one of the things that we've learned. So very good point, Luis. Let me switch to globally. Paulo, you know, uh, this is for Paulo and then for Saad. Um, you know, we, I thought we were on a good track with global health and that global health would help us, you know, through the, this pan, you know, emergencies like this pandemic. Um, didn't turn out to be the case. And, and Paulo, you've been one of the leaders interna you know, internationally on global health discourse. Um, what 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 needs what do we need to do to get better prepared, you know, using the global health model, or is that in, or is, is there a new model that has to be made? And I know you've been working about this with South to South collaborations within within the Americas, within you know, with Africa in very different fronts, and and, and I'm sure you must be disappointed to some degree, you know, about. Uh, but it would be good to hear your thoughts, and then hear. Thought, you know, Saad's thoughts on this same issue. I'm sorry for the, the provocative question. Bem, eu, eu penso uh, que nós, nós vamos ter que revisar o regulamento sanitário internacional, ou seja, esse grande mecanismo de regulação 
sobretudo dos processos epidêmicos pandêmicos. Essa revisão, o retorno dos Estados Unidos à OMS depois da espalhafatosa saída do presidente, não, eu acho que não foi do, do governo do Estado americano, foi do governo do presidente Trump. Tanto é verdade que, com Biden, Biden não só retorna à OMS, como faz essa declaração ontem, espetacular, única na história, única, que produz uma fissura fundamental no, nos processos de proteção à, à patentária, Há uma fissura irreversível. O presidente Biden vai entrar para a história da saúde pública por essa afirmação dele ontem. Eu quero cumprimentá-los por quem elegeu o presidente Biden e nós precisamos mudar aqui muita coisa aqui no Brasil se quisermos alcançar a grandiosidade das declarações do presidente ontem. E eu acho que os Estados Unidos vai ajudar muito a Fiocruz uh, e a Yale com seus, com seus grupos de saúde global poderão ajudar muito na discussão de dois ou três temas. A revisão do Regulamento Sanitário Internacional, ajudar os países de desenvolvimento da África através do, da CPLP. Nós podemos fazer uma cooperação triangular, Brasil, USP, Fiocruz, IEIO e os países africanos, por meio da comunidade de países de língua portuguesa, uma rede de institutos nacionais de saúde lá da região nós vemos ser criado agora, Albert, na região amazônica, uma rede pan-amazônica de genômica viral. A Amazônia é um laboratório permanente de surgimento de novas variantes. A organização do Tratado da Cooperação Amazônica, por proposta da Fundação Oswaldo Cruz, o presidente Nízia me autorizou a colocar a Fiocruz a esse serviço, criamos uma rede de vigilância genômica dos Institutos Nacionais de Saúde Pública da região pan-amazônica. É, Suriname, Guiana, Bolívia, Peru, Brasil. Essa rede genômica precisa do apoio da IEIO. Nós estamos conversando com a Fundação Rockefeller para apoiar essa, essa rede de vigilância genômica, de sequenciamento é, e de toda a questão enfim, da USP, a USP é uma potência, como disse o Luiz Carlos, é verdade, nossa irmã de trabalho. Então, nós temos que enfrentar, uh, Albert, as questões internacionais com uma visão internacional, com uma visão de cooperação solidária, de amizade. E já temos muitas coisas acontecendo que a pandemia nos fez organizar. E eu quero dizer, como diretor, dirigente da área de cooperação internacional da FEOCUS, tenho certeza que a Nízia concorda totalmente com isso, a minha presidente, nós queremos que eu venha cooperar com as ações de cooperação internacional da Fiocruz, na área de saúde global. Seu Paulo, Só vai ficar aí para nos, para nos confirmar. Yeah. Seu so, Paulo, dois grandes pontos. Um é que nós temos que acreditar em nossas multinacional instituições, em multinacional processos. E isso é o core. E o segundo, nós temos trabalho a fazer entre Yale, Fiocruz, USP, Brasil. Um, and, and those were two great ideas, um, you know, the, uh, to build off. Let me throw to Sa Saad, your, your, your thoughts. Thanks for asking this question. And it is, and I'm glad that you asked this question. And it is a provocative and, and good question to say, is this a failure of global health? I would say no. Uh, it is a failure of less global health, as, as Paolo was pointing to the U.S. absence from CEPI, U.S. absence from WHO. Uh, has had impact, uh, has impact in terms of lives, etc., and and has had impact on weakening the multilateral system. Frankly, Europe uh, got away with uh, putting minimal effort into it because, by contrast, compared to the U.S., it was a lot. But in its absolute sense, it wasn't a real serious grown-up investment into CEPI, um, uh, for example. And so, uh, so just like you know, when a patient dies, you don't say that uh, it's a failure of of the profession of medicine it's a it's a failure of that treatment so therefore you don't abandon medicine you so therefore we don't abandon global health we do better global health and we do it with honesty uh we do it by saying where things failed and where how can we strengthen the multilateral system but i will also expand this the the, the view on collaboration and there is representation on from 
uh, illustrious institutions uh, from Brazil and, and, and one from the US in this panel. So I will remind folks that these kinds of events like pandemics are often multi-generational uh, or once in a couple of generations events. Um, sometimes they happen more frequently, uh, sometimes they don't. So you have to keep the memory and the lessons alive from what happened today. And these lessons have to outlast us. Otherwise uh, we are not. So we have to plant trees that will bear fruit well after we are gone. So what is the best model? If you look around, what is the best model of keeping that intellectual memory alive? It is academic and research institutions. So Fio Cruz was, I think, 100, is 121 year old, if I, if I recall that correctly. And University of Sao Paulo had an older law school, but was founded in, in its university shape in 1934. Correct me if I, if I made an error there, but these are illustrious older institution, institutions. And our little university is 300 years old. And so that puts a unique responsibility. And this is longer than, I looked at it, the age of the top eight, uh, the, the eight Ivy League schools in the US is approximately 275 years. Uh, and the, the age of the top eight corporations in the US is approximately 65 years, uh, et cetera. So we outlast educational and uh, research institutions, outlast governments. They sometimes outlast republics. And so there, it is our unique responsibility that through our intellectual efforts, through our output, which is high quality and has longevity, and most importantly, through our teaching and mentoring in investing in the next generation and doing so across borders. We have a lot to learn from, for example, Brazilian institutions like we have learned from, uh, you know, for, for decades. And similarly, uh, we have a lot to offer as well. So we have to keep this memory, these lessons alive because we have a privileged position, not just in countries, not just in societies, but in civilizations. Good, so Saad, that is very well said. And I think it resonates with all of us. And it also resonates with the, the academic, but also our service um, mission. Of our, of, our, of our universities. And with that, I think that brought together a lot of the points that we're thinking about. It also tells us what our homework is. We, we do hope at Yale that, and I, I'm going to speak for Pericles and speak for you know, the administration, that we are very much um, for emotional, personal, but most importantly, for that mission of teaching the next generation. We're very much looking forward to continuing this discourse you know, with Luis Carlos and with Misia and Paulo, and of course, you, you know, with Saad, with our Institute of Global Health. And, and I think it sounds like we have some homework. Um, what would be the next iteration? What does that answer have to be? Uh, and that might be a nice position paper. And the reason why I think it makes my, myself proud to, um, to have been part of Rio Cruz, but also part of the initiatives in Brazil, is that Brazil is a, is a good model. Um, it's a model that has always believed in multilateralism, has always built, believed in collab, you know, collaboration, um, and, and that kind of sh strikes as a core, va core value uh, in that, and has made tremendous, you know, when we go back to yellow fever, or we go back to the eradication of 80s Egypti um, many years ago, it's been kind of, it's been a core value in the DNA of Brazilian scientists. So with that, I think, um, let me just, First of all, I'll give my heartfelt thanks to, to uh, President Nicia, to um, Director Paulo, um, to Dean Luis Carlos, and to our Vice Dean uh, Sad Omer here, Omer at, here at Yale for this uh, remarkable um, uh, forum. I think there's a lot of discussion ahead of, you know, ahead of us, and I look forward that we can engage in this and continue this because we, we have to come up with a plan. And the plan is urgent and critical. So thank you very much again for, and thank you for all the participants. Okay. Thank you for.